Four popular destruction assets in Unity. Are they good? What do they do? What don't they do? What don't they do well? All of these questions and more will be answered in this video. We'll be looking at Open Fracture, which is free and open source on GitHub. Destroy It, which is $75. Dino Fracture, which is $40. And Rayfire, which is a whopping $215. That's a lot. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy. Here to help you. Who, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become a reality by helping you pick a destruction library for your game. From the store pages, it's not always really clear what exactly are you getting from each of these assets. This is a problem not only with destruction assets, but as a whole, you're kind of hoping that whatever you see in the videos is what you think, and maybe there's documentation and you just have to dig through that. So I bought all of these assets to compare them Look at exactly what do they do and what don't they do, so that way you don't have to guess for yourself. All of them work on modern versions of Unity, so there's no problem there as long as you're running a recent version. I picked these four because I thought that they were relatively comparable. They all gave you the ability to destroy stuff in your game. So we'll start with the one called Destroy It, which is one of the first ones I actually mentioned on the channel from an asset perspective. And this one's a little bit of the oddball of the group. Destroy It is not a runtime mesh fracturing library and it does not have that capability at least as of today february 2023 what it does do is allow you to damage apply triggers play sound play particle systems and it gives you a couple of those out of the box as well and even apply rigid body force whenever you shoot something or shoot it with a rocket launcher you can now play explosions all that kind of stuff is handled by this library what it does do that's really cool that i hadn't considered before is you can blow up terrain trees and you can shoot them and have them fall over and that kind of stuff. I had never considered that that may be more challenging and apparently it is. It also has progressive damage that can be applied. So at different health amounts, it'll raise events to say, hey, we've you know hit this percentage or whatever. And using a secondary map, it'll apply progressive damage by making the secondary map more and more visible on the object. That makes it so you can apply procedural damage to any object by having these like cracks and stuff starting to appear. That's really cool, but that also limits you where you cannot use the secondary map for whatever detail map that you have going on there. The documentation for how to set it up is pretty good. It has a pretty long PDF that explains exactly how you can do this, how you do this, and all the functionality that's there for you to use. It all also comes with a single script, so it's very easy for you to integrate. You just slap that script on, configure it, and it's done, basically. You can configure that progressive damage from a variety of textures that they give you out of the box to see, okay, I want this one to have like larger cracks, maybe this one smaller cracks, and you can of course make your own as well. Destruction is handled basically the same way. I did a video a while ago about how to do runtime destruction. Destroy it's doing the exact same thing. You just replace your not destroyed prefab with a destroyed prefab and apply some force or whatever to it and to die, you have something exploding. Well, it does say it supports things like skin mesh renders and all these different kinds of things. A lot of that just comes out of the box for free whenever you're using a rigid body and applying force to stuff. I don't know, I wasn't super impressed with it. Maybe that's because I was expecting it to have fracturing and that was not there. The last negative I wanna say is I did notice there was a fixed update in the main script that you use to destroy stuff. So if you're gonna have a lot of destructible objects, there's gonna be more and more time eaten up by the CPU hitting this fixed update where maybe it's not doing anything. I didn't go into the of this because I'm, I may be doing tutorials about some of the things that it does here and I didn't want to steal anything from them. So after I was playing around with this for several hours, it was fun. It was cool. The progressive damage was an interesting thing I hadn't considered before, but the rest of it I felt like was a not a large jump from that video I showed on how to do destruction. So I feel like $75 for destroy it is a pretty steep price for what you're getting. I think part of my disappointment here is I was expecting fracturing based on one example that I saw in the demo video, and that's not there. I think if fracturing was supported in Destroy It, this would be a really great buy. The next ones we're gonna look at are all fracturing libraries. So we're gonna take a mesh, we're gonna dynamically at runtime either slice it or break it up into little chunks, and then possibly apply some force to those afterwards. We're gonna go up in price. So we're gonna start with the free open source one called Open Fracture. This is licensed under the MIT license, and you can install it with the package manager by just providing the GitHub URL. Open Fracture does a really good job of 
calling out specifically what they do not support on their limitations on the main page on their GitHub. This is a relatively long list. It's really important to understand what does this mean? And we'll be taking a look a little bit later about what do some of these mean and what happens if you try to do something that's specifically marked as not supported. They have a demo scene and it's really simple, but it showcases how do you make it work? You just attach the fracture script to whatever object you want to fracture. It'll make sure there's some kind of a collider and a rigid body. Configure it with how many objects should it fracture into and a bunch of other stuff you can see here. Once you've configured it, it can destroy when there's impact with another collider. You can set it up so there's only specific tags that will trigger the destruction. So you can have it where it'll only fracture whenever it's hit by a projectile, for example, or projectile or something else falling on it, but maybe not if it just falls to the floor or maybe you also wanted to do that. There's a lot of different use cases you can configure based on how you want your game to work. So it looks pretty cool. Those objects are being fractured whenever they make collision, that's perfect. It also has a really cool feature called refracturing. So if I've shot one of these letters or the base or anything like that, I can then shoot the piece again and have that piece fractured again. That's a really cool thing. The same goes for slicing. We can slice objects and then we can slice them again. So if you have like a lightsaber you want to cut through stuff, you can use the mesh slicing. There is one option called asynchronous. I don't really like this because it ends up giving you some weird results. If you make it asynchronous and it takes more than like one frame, you'll notice that stuff will pop around. So you can see that on the screen right now. If I turn on async and I start shooting something because I shot it with a rigid body, it moves. The async fracture takes a second, it fractures and moves back. So that's kind of weird. Depending on your use case, maybe you have it where it can't move. And so you shoot it, it won't move, and then you can have the async fracture, but it still looks kind of weird if I shoot it and then like two seconds later it fractures. One thing I really like is Open Fracture does support callbacks for whenever something has started fracturing and whenever that fracturing has completed. So if you have async on, for example, you will get different times of fracturing started versus fracturing completed. If you have async off, you'll get those pretty much back to back. But it's really nice that they give us that level of events. Now let's talk about some of the negatives of Open Fracture. The documentation really isn't very good. There's very minimal documentation on the GitHub. It's basically whatever you see on the demo scenes and a couple of pages of readmes that are pretty brief. It being free and open source, sometimes we can look past some of these things, but the limitations also here, you need to be really careful about. A couple of common things that you might run into that are limitations of open fracture is if you have a mesh that's open, meaning it's not fully closed on all sides, that's not officially supported and you do get weird results. Having sub meshes is not supported, meaning if you have a model and you have more than one material, you're gonna lose all of the materials except the first one whenever we do the fracturing. I'm not gonna sit here and read all of them, but these are the two most likely ones I think you're gonna run across that you need to really consider if you're gonna think about using open fracture. I found that open fracture works really well for those simple use cases where we have a single material on a mesh and we wanna destroy kind of smaller objects. I can see where these limitations would come into play and I personally don't think I would be using open fracture in my own game. But if maybe destruction is just a nice like fun thing that happens in your game and isn't a core piece of the game, or maybe you're not doing larger scale destruction, open fracture might work really well for you and it's free. I'm going to talk about a little bit later considerations to think about whenever you're going to try to set up like large scale fracturing or destruction if you wanted to have like entire levels destroyed or something like that. I'll talk about those considerations towards the end of the video. The next one up is Dino Fracture coming in at $40. The first thing I noticed about Dino Fracture is the documentation is really sparse. The demo scene is where the majority of the documentation is, which is okay, but it's kind of annoying to have to go back to the demo scene every time you wanna see how something should be done. Having written documentation is always really nice to be able to say, okay, here, so I can reference that while I'm in the middle of developing something in my own scenes. Dino Fracture has one primary script that we'll use whenever we wanna have something fracture called Runtime Fracture Geometry. So it works very similar to Open Fracture where you just attach the fracture script. In this case, we use runtime fracture geometry. From there, we can configure all kinds of stuff very similarly to what you just saw with open fracture. But what I really like about dino fracture is we don't have to apply a rigid body to the fractured object. This I think is really awesome because if I have, for example, a building that I want to have get destroyed, I don't want to put a rigid body on that. All the pieces that get fractured off, I would want to have, but the building itself I don't want a rigid body on. The building's not moving. 
Basically everything we just saw with open fractures is also supported here. We have mesh slicing, we can re-slice meshes that we've sliced before, we can fracture any object, we can refracture objects. Diamond Fracture also has asynchronous fracture support. It has the same problem as open fracture, where it can be a noticeable delay from when impact happens and when fracturing happens, if maybe your computer is running too slow or you have too many pieces trying to come up there. Let's say Dino Fracture has a little bit more cool features, like we can have dynamic chipping of an object, and the chipping is really what I expected the Destroy It demo to have, where we have a wall and we're shooting out little pieces of it. Dino Fracture does that exactly as I was expecting Destroy It to have. We can destroy a wall and then we can start shooting the little pieces off and chip off pieces of the wall based on where we shot it. So that's a really cool feature. We can have anchor points to make sure that Maybe if we want to shoot out the middle of a glass, the sides stay attached to the walls, but we can shoot out the middle. In terms of callbacks, Dino Fracture only has on Fracture completed, but it gives you a lot of information from a scripting perspective. I really like this. We have all kinds of information. A lot of the limitations we saw on Open Fracture do not apply to Dino Fracture. For example, we can use custom prefabs for whenever something is destroyed. We can have open face meshes. Dino Fracture will warn us about it and apparently does some cleanup on the inside. We can also have multiple materials on the same object and those will be fractured properly, retaining those original materials. Working with Dino Fracture was really pleasant. Overall, I really like it. I think it's an inexpensive option to get really good fracturing at runtime into your game. The documentation I wish was better, but really that's the only negative I really come up with. So Dino Fracture, I think it does well what it's trying to do, and it's relatively inexpensive. I think that's a really good deal for what you're getting here. Now, Rayfire. Rayfire is $215. That's a lot of money for an asset. I honestly, I had really high expectations of Rayfire going into this because it's just, it's a lot of money. And I've got to say, Rayfire is the Lamborghini of Lamborghinis of destruction assets. If you've watched the whole video up to this point, all I can say is if you take Dino Fracture and like 10 exit, you get Rayfire. Rayfire has an incredible number of configuration options about, you'll generally want to use the Rayfire rigid script here to configure stuff. And there's just a million options for what can you do how do you want it to work? How do you want it to fracture? You can activate stuff by a method or you can do it just automatically. So if you want it to fall down, which is mostly what we're gonna look at today, you'd have it initialize on start, but you also have the option to dynamically initialize it with your code, which enables a lot of use cases. It also has the option for you to shatter an object without using Rayfire Rigid, so you can get really cool destruction effects where you have like radial ones that go out. You have the standard one, you can have it do bricks. There's all kinds of options here. I think that's maybe the theme of Rayfire is you have options for how you want destruction to work. It does support all the things we've been talking about so far. So if you have open faces, no problem. Self-intersecting geometry, no problem multiple materials, no problem. You want to only get shattered by specific objects of a tag, no problem. You want to automatically spawn dust and debris whenever it shatters, no problem. That's included out of the box. You want to slice the mesh, no problem. You want to slice it and then destroy it, no problem. It also comes with a manager, so that way you can customize, hey, I only want to have at most 15 particle systems playing at a time. It will dynamically, based on the material type of the object you're destroying, apply realistic weights to the fractured objects based on size and density of that type of things. All of their scripts have custom editors that are really well organized. Pretty much all the fields have documentation on the field. There's also incredible amounts of documentation included in the asset and also online. They have tutorials, they have overviews of each scene explaining to you how is it set up? Why is it set up that way? What are the configurations that are used here that are important? Though there are two drawbacks I see with Rayfire. One of them is the sheer amount of customizations. You can get a little bit lost. So if you're going to decide, hey, I do want to purchase Rayfire, take a little bit of time to read through some of that extensive documentation they give you. Take a little bit of time to explore those tutorials to understand what do these configuration options do before you just try to jump in and integrate into your project. So that's kind of like a, I don't know, backhanded, drawback, like it's not really a drawback, but it's a drawback. And the other one is the price. $215 is a lot of money, especially if you're like a solo dev and you're trying to implement destruction, you might be like, heck no, I'm not paying $215. If destruction is a core piece of your game, there is not a better way for you to implement destruction into your game. It's just not. This is like the Lamborghini of destruction. If destruction is not a core piece of your game, it may be too expensive and may be too 
bells and whistles -y. you may be better off purchasing Dino Fracture, save the extra $170 and use that on something else for your game. I thought now we'd take a look at the demo scene that I put together that has some meshes that highlight some of those limitations that Open Fracture mentioned. And I did this to see, do Dino Fracture and Rayfire have the same limitations or do they handle these well? With Open Fracture, you can see very clearly why those limitations are stated. Whenever we have open faces, there's like random extra triangles that happen. Whenever we have two meshes on the same object, it loses the second material and just applies that inner material everywhere else. If we look at the exact same setup, just using Dino Fracture, we can see that it handles all of those use cases gracefully. It even retains those open faces on the fractured objects. That may or may not be what you actually want to happen, but that's the way that it's working. It'll retain those materials, regardless if we have multiple, it doesn't really matter how many we have. It'll retain all of those there and apply that inner material to only the new face that we added to the object. So that's really awesome. With the Rayfire, you can see it also handles all of this geometry, no problem. And it behaves a little bit differently than Dino Fracture. Wherever we have those open faces, it closes that with the inner material and then fractures the mesh. So it creates closed geometry and then it goes and fractures that object. We'll see the torus with Rayfire. We can also make it float and make it get activated whenever the falling object comes near. It of course can maintain the multiple different materials and just adds in the inner material whenever it's adding new faces. So the last thing I wanna say is if you're going to create destruction and you want destruction into your game, please think about that up front. You can't very easily just take anything off the asset store and say, hey, here you go, destruction slap all these components on there and you're good to go. It's actually what I tried to do for this video. I was going to take another asset that has like a city and I was going to have it like blow up these rails and the buildings and all this kind of stuff. thought it was going to be really awesome. The way that these models are constructed weren't conducive for destruction because of one solid mesh, it really doesn't destroy very well. Most likely your assets that you want to be destroyed need to be authored a little bit differently than what you would do if you're not going to consider destruction. For example, if we take like the Dino Fracture and the Destroy It demo scenes, in there they had the wall that we could like chip away at. If you want that to be a component of your game, you need to have like rebar inside or be able to add rebar inside afterwards with its own collider so you can chip away at the wall. Destruction like that, like detailed level destruction is not something that's just plug and play and go. You really have to have your models constructed in a way for you to be able to destroy them. It's not going to be just an hour in and Ta-da, I have widespread destruction across my game. At least not that looks good like what we see in like Battlefield, for example. If you're looking to do smaller scale destruction with like boxes that get destroyed, lights, lampposts, that kind of stuff, those can be relatively easily integrated and just slap the destruction thing on and it's probably okay. I'm a little bit surprised that it actually worked out this way. I kind of expected maybe Open Fracture to be really good and then be like, why would you spend money on Dino Fracture or on Rayfire? but it ended up being as I went up in price on the fracturing libraries, it really got a lot better. It was a really interesting experience for me to go and get through this video like that. I know that this was a little bit different than we normally do on this channel. So if you did like this video and you wanna see more of this content, be sure to like the video to give me that feedback. And did you know that only 22% of you are subscribed? What's going on there? And remember, new videos are posted every tutorial Tuesday. And if you wanna support this channel, you can go to patreon.com slash academy or just click the join button right here on YouTube. You can get your name up here on the screen. You get a voice shout out starting with the awesome tier. Speaking of those awesome supporters, there's Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Matt Parkin, Ivan, Rulin, Paul Berry, and Ify Obelis. At the tremendous tier, there's Bruno Bozic. And at the phenomenal tier, there's Andrew Bowen and Andrew Albright. Thank you all for your support. I'm incredibly grateful.